suspicions. Now the House Oversight Committee looks at the future of the Food and Drug Administration, hearing from the current commissioner and several former FDA commissioners. Committee chairman is Henry Waxman of California. This is two hours and 15 minutes. Meeting of the committee will come to order. Before I make any specific comments on today's uh, hearing on FDA, I want to say a few words about an important initiative uh, this committee is undertaking. One of the most important debates in modern politics is the role of government. Some believe in the smallest government possible and live by the old joke that the scariest words imaginable are, I'm from the federal government and I've come to help. I and others have a fundamentally different view. I think government can be a tremendous instrument for good, and I've seen it help Americans in countless ways. The Social Security system transformed this country. Landmark health and environmental laws have improved the quality of life for millions of Americans. Regulatory and consumer agencies have made financial stability, basic safety precautions a part of our everyday life. In this regard, FDA has had a remarkable record of achievements. It has been and by and large remains an agency with highly qualified and dedicated staff doing a big job under difficult circumstances. It's our job to ensure that it has the resources to continue to perform with confidence. We have reason to be concerned to examine the strengths and weaknesses of this agency in the light of ever-increasing demands and to ensure that it remains strong. Because we know from other areas that without proper support or without a deliberate uh, uh, strengthening of the agency and support for the agency's leadership uh, or uh, without uh, making sure there's not unwarranted outside interfer interference, things can change. We need only look at FEMA. FEMA once was one of the, the uh, most prominent and well-respected agencies of government. But something has gone very wrong in recent years. We saw government at its worst during the Hurricane Katrina disaster. FEMA completely failed American citizens. We saw it break down. We saw a breakdown again at Walter Reed Hospital in the deplorable conditions provided to our bravest Americans. And we've seen profound problems from government handling uh, in the Iraq war, where there was flawed basic intelligence to failure to supply our troops with the right armor and equipment. In all these cases, we know that incompetent government can have deadly consequences. So one of the most important responsibilities for our committee is to understand what's gone wrong, how did some of the best government agencies become so weak, and we need to work together in a bipartisan way to get government back on track. I know colleagues on both sides of the aisle share my view on this. We don't want government programs to be ineffective. We want them to be models of excellence. So over the next year, our committee is going to hold a series of hearings on making government effective again by looking at the performance of a number of different agencies. We start today with FDA. By the end of these hearings, we'll have a better idea of the impact of budget cuts and cronyism on current problems. And I expect we'll have legislative solutions that would ensure taxpayers get the government they deserve. Today we start this effort. We are in the fortunate position of looking first at an agency that has not been decimated by the pressures placed upon it or the lack of resources made available to it. But there have been a number of public health crises, from the belated withdrawal of Vioxx to deadly bacteria in spinach to contaminated pet food. These have revealed alarming cracks in the foundation of FDA's ability to protect the American public. The warning signs are clear. FDA is an agency in crisis. We need to act now and to learn from the vast experience of those who have managed the agency through the years. And today we're fortunate to have an unprecedented assembly of experts, including three former FDA commissioners and the current commissioner, Dr. Andrew von Eschenbach. 
In addition, two former commissioners whose schedules did not allow them to be here in person will submit written testimony. I especially want to thank uh, the Commissioner for accommodating the Committee's request that he testify on the same panel as the other witnesses. I recognize it is the Administration's policy for governmental officials to testify on panels without, uh, without non-governmental witnesses, and today's arrangement is not intended to nullify that policy. Since this hearing presents a highly unusual circumstance gathering the former and current head of a single agency, uh, we appreciate the Commissioner's departure from the general agency practice today. Thank you very much. FDA oversees thousands of products so routine that we don't even notice them. Oatmeal, aspirin, even microwaves and cell phones. FDA also oversees products for the times in our life that are anything but routine. Days we need emergency surgery, chemotherapy, or a blood transfusion. FDA's mission is vast and daunting, but not impossible. The agency's history is full of success stories, whether it was protecting consumers from rotten meat in the early 1900s, saving lives by refusing to let thalidomide on the market in the 1950s, or speeding AIDS drugs to patients in the 1990s. But as I have said, recent years have brought signs of trouble at the FDA, and at this hearing we hope to learn the causes of these problems and we'll uh, look at four major areas of concern. The first and most critical issue facing FDA is simple resources. The agency, in my opinion, is vastly underfunded, relying on an already shrinking budget to tackle a rapidly expanding list of responsibilities. In fact, FDA's entire budget for fiscal year 2007 is less than the budget for Montgomery County, Maryland schools, uh, the whole system uh, for this year. A second major concern is scientific integrity at the agency. In recent years, key decisions at FDA have been made under the cloud of real or perceived political interference, undermining FDA's most basic foundation. A third area of concern is enforcement. Investigations by our staff and other analysts have found that across the agency, from post-market uh, drug trials to drug advertising to the handling of fresh produce, FDA's enforcement activity has declined. Strong enforcement is a critical component of FDA's work, and I'm concerned to see how it has atrophied in recent years. And finally, we must look closely at FDA's legal authorities, authorities to examine whether its governing provisions are outdated or inadequate. One prominent example is in the area of food regulation, where our standards are literally a century old. On the topic of food safety, I want to acknowledge that this morning the FDA announced that it will create a new position for food protection at the agency. This idea of a food safety czar seems like a reasonable idea, and I support FDA in taking steps to increase the priority of food safety at the agency. I hope that as the agency begins to undertake long-term strategic thinking, I think the need remains for an immediate response to the current crisis and hope that Today's announcement will be followed by concrete and effective action. For all its challenges, FDA remains one of our nation's greatest assets. I call this hearing because I believe in this agency, and I want to see it work. As the primary oversight committee of the House, it is the committee's responsibility to identify and begin to address the urgent challenges facing the FDA, and we'll see in other hearings other agencies as well. I hope that this series of hearings will lead to real solutions for FDA and for government, restoring the full capacity and preparing this agency and others to serve its critical mission many years into the future. I thank our witnesses for being here today. I look forward to their testimony. But before we call on them and recognize them, I want to have the ranking member of our committee, Mr. Davis, uh, uh, give him time to make an opening no, statement. No, thank you, uh, Mr. Waxman. I know how important these issues have been to you over the years. And you really hit it on the head. It's about governance. Um, some on my side just think we ought to have very little government. Let's starve it. Let's not give it the funding. There are others who think more government, the better, that we can accomplish more. But we don't focus enough on the governance issues, and that is getting it right and making it efficient. Um, 
I want to thank you for holding today's hearing to consider the critical mission of the FDA and the many challenges the agency faces keeping face with rapidly evolving science in an increasingly global marketplace. The FDA's basic mission is to promote and protect public health by approving and monitoring the marketing of safe and effective products. The agency is also responsible for providing current science-based information to the public on key health issues. But in recent years, the FDA has stumbled through some high-profile missteps. The withdrawal of the painkiller Vioxx caused many to ask if drugs were being approved too fast and monitored too little after reaching the marketplace. The shortage of vaccine for the 2004-2005 flu season raised questions about how best to regulate and stimulate production of biopharmaceutical products. And the FDA role in food safety arose again when E. coli contamination was found in fresh spinach this year and most recently with the nationwide recall of Peter Pan peanut butter. Most Americans believe that once something gets FDA approval, it carries the Federal Government's equivalent of the good housekeeping seal of approval. It can be used without worry or risk. We need to be sure that confidence is not misplaced or grounded only on the legend of an infallible FDA or the myth of risk-free products. We should indulge neither legend nor myth when entrusting critical questions of safety, efficacy and risk to Federal decision makers. But we should do everything possible to ensure the FDA has the statutory tools, the talent and the resources necessary to operate effectively, efficiently and transparently. No one should have any cause to doubt that, even if they are sometimes get it wrong. The FDA is guided only by the best science available and acts solely in the interests of the American consumer. At stake, in the FDA getting it, at stake in the FDA getting it right is the health and safety of the American people and the viability of a huge and growing sector of our economy. Industries regulated by the FDA generate hundreds of billions of dollars in sales revenue, support important research and create high value jobs. Continued loss of confidence in the FDA takes us down a path we simply cannot afford either financially or in terms of public health. The FDA has to stand out as a trusted, unbiased, vigilant watchdog over the nation's food and drug supply. Nevertheless, recent high-profile recalls and contaminations heighten concerns about the capability and credibility of the Federal agency charged to assure the safety and effectiveness of so many medicines, foods, cosmetics and other products millions of Americans use every day. So we ask, how can we strengthen the security and safety of foods that now travel around our country and across the world with unprecedented speed? How can FDA work with regulated industries to better ensure the safety of approved drugs and medical devices? What can be done to improve product manufacturing and handling practices? How can post-marketing surveillance of approved products be strengthened and who will pay for it? And do current adverse event reporting systems capture the reliable and timely data FDA needs to inform sound regulatory decisions? This committee has looked at some of these questions before. As Chairman, I convened similar oversight hearings on drug safety and post-marketing surveillance issues surrounding the withdrawal of Vioxx from the market. We also investigated FDA oversight of reprocessed single-use medical devices. Hearings were held on efforts to address the growing problems of illegal pharmacy websites. And we have closely monitored food safety and dietary supplement issues. Our investigation into the flu vaccine shortage resulted in more frequent on-site FDA inspections of vaccine manufacturing facilities. With regard to this range of issues, it can't be said we didn't do some oversight. So I'm happy Chairman Waxman has chose to keep the focus on these important issues. He believes fervently in the need for a strong, independent and effective FDA and has worked over many years to sustain and strengthen the agency's capabilities. Given that bipartisan consensus, I look forward to a thoughtful discussion today on the future of the FDA and how to address the many and complex challenges faced by the critical Federal agency. We're fortunate to have before us such a distinguished panel of witnesses. All have held the top leadership post at the FDA and share invaluable experience running one of the nation's most important public health and consumer protection agencies. I look forward to their testimony, their insights and their perspectives. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Davis. Well, we do have a very distinguished um, uh, panel before us. We have uh, our first witness, Dr. Donald Kennedy. He was the FDA commissioner appointed by Secretary Joseph Califano and uh, April 1977 and served until 1979. During his tenure, the agency dealt with the repercussions of the attempt to ban saccharin, attempted to overall the drug uh, provisions of the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act and, uh, and, and uh, in the proposed Drug Regulation Reform Act of 78. He's an internationally recognized neurophysiologist who headed both the FDA and Stanford University 
and the present time serves as the Editor-in-Chief of Science. We're pleased to have you with us. Our next uh, witness will be Dr. Frank Young, who was the FDA Commissioner sworn in by Secretary of Health and Human Services Margaret Heckler in August of 1984 and served until December 1989. During his tenure, he initiated the user fee process and approved the first drug to combat AIDS and instituted a fast-track approval system for AIDS drugs. He was also appointed by President Reagan and confirmed by the Senate as a U.S. member of the Executive Committee of the World Health Organization. He's currently the chairman and CEO of the Cosmos Alliance, a partner in Essex Woodlands Hill Health Ventures, and serves on the board of directors of five companies. We're pleased to have you, Dr. Young. Third witness will be Dr. David Kessler, the FDA commissioner appointed by President George H.W. Bush in 1990 and reappointed by President Clinton, serving until 1997. And during his tenure, he acted to speed approval of new drugs, placed high priority in getting promising therapies for serious and life-threatening diseases to patients as quickly as possible. He introduced a number of new programs, including nutrition labeling for food, user fees for drugs and biologics, preventive controls to improve food safety, and the MedWatch program. He served as the uh, dean of Yale University uh, School of Medicine and is currently the dean of the School of Medicine and the vice chancellor for medical affairs at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Kessler, we're pleased to have you. And the final witness will be Dr. Andrew von Eschenbach, who was sworn in as the 20th commissioner on the December 13, 2006. At the time of his appointment, he was the uh, director of the National Cancer Institute. Dr. von Eschenbach is a nationally recognized urologic surgeon and oncologist. We're pleased to have you as well. Uh, it is the practice of this committee for all witnesses to uh, have them sworn in. And so I, I do ask you, if you would, to please uh, rise and raise your right hand. Do you uh, promise and affirm to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will reflect that uh, each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And, um, and now we'd like to call on the w witnesses. And our first uh, witness is Dr. Kennedy. There's a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it's on and close enough to you that we can pick Mr. it up. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to appear before the committee. I, I want to thank you especially for organizing this splendid reunion. Uh, you asked me to provide some information that might be helpful to the committee in uh, examining its uh, responsibilities for oversight of the Food and Drug Administration as it faces new challenges. I want to touch briefly on some of those before turning to uh, 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 an analysis of, of other factors. Among the current problems, that, as you have noted, are food safety, uh, difficult questions surrounding the safety of already marketed drugs, preparations for pandemic influenza, and an old problem that owes much to the unavailability of a sound adverse reaction reporting system problems in monitoring the safety of already marketed drugs. These problems naturally arise within the orbit of FDA's own st statutory and regulatory authority, but there are some problems that seem to have arise, uh, arisen from the outside, and let me just mention those quickly. Uh, for only a fraction of the past six years has the FDA had at its head a commissioner confirmed by the Senate. I think we all know that FDA could function pretty well for short periods without a leader. It has a competent, highly graded technical civil service staff, but FDA enjoys frequent external challenges that must be met by leadership that is fully authorized and credible and in place, and too often it has not had that kind of leadership. I'm glad it does now. A second problem is that FDA has for some time been chronically underfunded and understaffed. If you compare the 03 budget with the current uh, one for 07, it's a disheartening story. Uh, to conserve its, uh, its purchasing power from one year to the next, uh, FDA re would require an increase of about 5.8 percent in that year dollars. And at that rate of increase, FDA's 2007 budget would have been about a million 924, a billion 924. Uh, and in fact, its actual appropriation was a billion 558, a shortage uh, 
uh, amounting to uh, an under budgeting of 20 percent below uh, what was needed. I think my fellow ex-commissioners would agree that an appropriated budget of $2 billion in F FY08 would be needed to restore FDA's capabilities to the level at which it functioned in 08, in 03. FDA is furthermore a payroll intensive agency and I'm sure it's no mystery to members of this committee that uh, it has the same problems that a small business has and that is with the rising share that, ben that benefits programs, especially health benefits programs, take of the budget. So as a consequence, FDA not only has less money in 07 than it had in 03, surprisingly, it has a disproportionately lower number of FTEs. So uh, it's, a, it's a truly difficult situation for the agency. It might be asked whether an increase in user fees couldn't substitute for appropriated funds. I don't think so for two reasons. First, some citizens on hearing that the drug industry contributes significantly to FDA's work may wonder whether that opens the door to subtle influence. I'm convinced that it does not, but the perception may be more general than we hope. Far more important is that FDA's user fees are restricted to activities related to the new drug approval process. They are thus not equivalent to appropriated funds, which must cover the full spectrum of FDA activities. The user fees permit the hiring of more drug reviewers, but don't pay the external cost that any additional FTE, FTE un, undoubtedly brings to the rest of the organization. So when the drug approvals process uh, succeeds, food suffers. I, I, I want to, I want to, echo a point made by the re recent study of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. It makes the point that there is a large disparity between the resources available for the new drug re review and approval processes at, at FDA and those available for the monitoring of drug safety. The IOM report makes some useful recommendations concerning the capacity of FDA to undertake risk assessment and risk management with respect to already marketed drugs, of which I will mention a, a little bit more later. I hope the Congress will examine with special care those recommendations about the public availability of the results of clinical trials actions. In agreement with several major medical journals, IOM urges that the industry sponsors be required to register at clinicaltrials.gov uh, all of the clinical trials that, that they are uh, about to conduct, uh, phase two through phase four. The key here is that full information about the conduct of these trials and the problems that may arise with them should be made available to the public. Uh, are they? Uh, FDA has invested significant labor in making the, those records available at its website. There appears, this appears to be an appropriate response to Section 5.1 of the IOM report, but to call them publicly available in any real sense uh, is not right. With the help of uh, the director of clinicaltrials.gov, I got walked through that website uh, to find records of the trials for Ketek, a drug about which important safety issues have arisen. One can get to the right pages, but although the trials are listed there, there's no information about the institutions, the investigators, or the problems that might have arisen in the course of those trials. One can get to the right pages, uh, but you, you can't learn very much from them. Even that list is impossible to find unless one knows what one is looking for, and the studies cannot be linked to from clinicaltrials.gov. I think that with some support for information technology, the navigability of this site could be improved to validate FDA's promise that this vital information is publicly available. I want to make two more very quick points related to that topic. First, the IOM report asks Congress to give FDA authorities that it could apply to require conditions for distribution of already marketed drugs. These would include the capacity to make FDA-initiated changes in drug labels, a moratorium on direct consumer advertising if that were deemed necessary, or various other conditions. As with other needs, this is going to require appropriated funds and not user fees. 
I also want to make a quick mention of uh, another serious risk that FDA confronts now in the drug area, namely antibiotic resistance. Uh, that problem is bad both on the supply side and the demand side. The demand side, doctors and patients are, are not uh, conforming uh, to, to the, the most risk averse uh, kind of behavior uh, and need some encouragement as, as do hospitals. Uh, more important, perhaps, on the supply side, uh, there, there is a good case for a kind of orphan drug protection for new antibiotics where already existent antibiotics have shown serious resistance problems and may need replacement. Mr. Chairman, FDA had to explain repeatedly to the Congress back in my day that it was difficult to pursue a comprehensive program for evaluating the safety of our already marketed products. The reason is that in order to calculate an adverse reaction rate, you need to know the numerator, the number of observed problems, and the denominator, the number of prescriptions that are out there. You can't find the rate without both. FDA's numerator depends on a largely voluntary reporting system involving doctors and firms. The denominator has to be constructed, for example, through a prescription system in which an extra copy recording only the drug's identity and the dosage is made centrally available for data storage. That, unfortunately, is not available. And the ironic result of the Vioxx study done by FDA is that it had to be done at Kaiser Permanente, the only, the only organiz healthcare organization. HMO that had enough patients and a good enough record keeping system so that you could get both the numerator and the de denominator. Uh, that that uh, is a problem that really needs fixing. Uh, and I'll conclude with just a couple of other uh, quick uh, summary notes. Uh, this is an important agency, as you know. Uh, uh, it, it accounts for about 25 cents out of every consumer dollar spent in this country. If we expect our, to have our spinach uncontaminated, our pet food safe, Congress needs to provide FDA with the resources and the authorities it needs, especially on that broken food side, of which I know you'll hear more from Dr. Kessler. So I hope your, your staff and, and your colleagues on the committee uh, will continue uh, your diligence about pursuing FDA resource needs. Uh, unfortunately, to hear the bad news, you have to rely occasionally on old timers like me because budget authorities at HHS and OMB uh, prohibit present officials in the agency for speaking out publicly as enthusiastically as they would like uh, about the need for more funding. I used to squirm about this in my day, but it's a fact of life. So I know this is no use to you, news to you, but I hope that the American public, which expects a lot from the FDA, knows that when its officials express satisfaction with their budget allocations, they have their fingers crossed underneath the witness table. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Dr. Young. Mr. Chairman, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you again and to have the opportunity uh, with uncrossed fingers to talk about the agency. I'd like to mention a few things based on my experience of 12 years in government, part in the FDA, part in the office of the Assistant Secretary, and also part as a citizen, as a pastor, a person that works in industry as well as with consumers, and focus on the point that this is the single most important consumer agency in the world. We are the gold standard. Much of the world follows the FDA, and at least in our time when the FDA sneezed, the world uh, got pneumonia. It's an agency that's watched and has been looked at for guidance. Yet, unfortunately, this agency is suffering, and it is suffering significantly. It's suffering from neglect of short-term commissioners. It's suffering from a workload that greatly outstrips its resources. It's suffering from an accelerating technological challenges without the ability to recruit the people that are necessary for those new fields. It needs to be at the forefront of science. We're in the world now of genomics, proteomics, variety of nanotechnologies, 
a program where we're looking at cellular therapy, cellular regeneration, as well as the classical issues of drug safety, food safety, veterinary safety, cosmetics. The new challenges cannot be addressed without a steady stream of recruitment of personnel at the forefront of their science fields, and importantly, an opportunity for their continual education, continued training, and I would definitely submit research. As you know, and this committee knows, the research at the Center for Biologic Evaluation and Research has been eviscerated. There is very little research at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Yes, we do have coordination with NIH, but it is, in my opinion, important to have a research program available within FDA itself. Similarly, there are problems with the research programs in the Center for Foods. I would submit that the agency requires much more than a bandage. And in fact, it is important as additional resources are, they are not the sole solution. And I would like to point out some of these other points that are necessary uh, for you to make a diagnosis of what is safe for the professionals and those outside the agency that uh, rely on it, and what is effective to restore this agency to its previous strong state. I'd like to start exactly where Dr. Kennedy did. The turnover and the short-term commissioners in recent years has been scandalous. It is very difficult for the agency to have a directed focus if it has a revolving door syndrome at the agency. The career professionals are outstanding. But without guidance and direction of where the agency should be going, and yes, protection at congressional hearings and other events, it is difficult for the agency uh, to function. I would also submit and would recommend that you look at the recruitment process at FDA for commissioners. Dr. Kennedy and I were recruited by search committees. We were able to be appointed by the secretarial process. Uh, Dr. Kessler had a lightning swift uh, hearing for confirmation. I guess you said it was about eight days. Uh, there have been months and months of prolonged foot dragging of getting commissioners concern, uh, confirmed. And I wonder whether it would not even be better to return to the pre-confirmation status. I'd ask you to look at that. I would also suggest that you consider a six-year term for the commissioner. There needs to be stability and for an individual to know that this is his mandate, her mandate, for a period of time and our professional leader of the uh, agency. When I was in, in the agency, I converted to a professional status in the Commission Corps and stayed in government for the rest of my professional life in medicine. And I think that concept of being recruited to come to government for service is very important. A lot easier for lawyers to come in and out of government, harder for professionals in health sciences to come in, but I would urge that we make that possible. The next thing that I would like to, to urge your members to look at is really the strength of the scientific base. And here, in addition to the topics that I mentioned earlier, is the need to allow professionals to have training and time to d pursue their own studies. When I was running a large lab, I had about 33 people with me when I was at the University of Rochester, I stumbled on a fact that I would get much more productivity out of a postdoc or a graduate student if I asked them to work 80% on my effort and 20% on their own. Some of the best leads came from their time, not my imaginations. I think it's important that the professional staff of the agency have time for professional renewal and, when appropriate, research in the very areas that they're regulating. In my watch, we recruited Kathy Zoon from NIH at the very time when interferon was being looked at for for evaluation. She was skilled and actually did research on that. It was one of the fastest approvals of new biologics because she could weigh the safety, the effectiveness, and was familiar with it. That familiarity, I think, is key in the scientific uh, personnel. I also would recommend that there be a comprehensive review of the drug and biologic evaluation process. The last one occurred over 20 years ago. There have been many excellent initiatives that have been added, but they've sort of been added like onion rings 
around the surface of a small nub, and each administration adds a larger and larger number of onion rings. And for those on the outside looking, whether it's clinical trial research and, and results, food safety, or the persons trying to submit proposals for evaluation to FDA, it becomes a morass of conflicting, overlapping, difficult to understand regulations. And I would urge that all of this in this time when there is a review of FDA be looked at and possibly uh, seen as a way to go forward and revise this sort of a program. I think unequivocally a comprehensive drug safety program is essential. I would also like to take this opportunity to look just briefly at the budget distortions that PDUFA made. I had the privilege, as you mentioned, of initiating that. My good colleague David Kessler uh, continued it. Neither of us ever thought that the distortions that have occurred would occur here, where the one portion of the budget stays high and the other goes down. Uh, very, very difficult to manage the agency, and drug safety has been left behind. I would urge that, if at all possible, that there be a program to have an appropriated budget for that. It's what I favor. However, if it is not possible, we cannot delay in some sort of a program where a database is built with a small charge, maybe a nickel, a script, so that we can have a Kaiser-like system over the entire drug safety review. In that way, FDA could point out what reviews need to be done, and if necessary, groups in the private sector could undertake those analyses. But to let this go one more congressional session without strongly addressing drug safety would be a charade and an abuse of the American public that relies on safe and effective medicines. I would also urge that we bring a screeching halt to unfunded mandates. During the time that I was commissioner, there were 22 of them. Uh, we scrambled around. We, as a coordinating council, met to try to see where we could shift resources. But it was very hard. Uh, you know, and, and, and I know very well of the act that bears your name, the Hatch-Waxman Act. I had the privilege of trying to implement that. It was underfunded. We had a terrible time trying to bring those standards in. You're now looking at follow-on biologics. I would urge strongly that the greatest caution be taken in devising the law, implementing the regulations, and providing both the resources for evaluation, but also enforcement. We had great problems in the early days of enforcement with the Hatch-Waxman Act, and I think that needs to be uh, looked at. The inspectional staff in FDA is underfunded, undermanned, and overwhelmed. I remember at one hearing at OMB, I brought in a dead chicken. We left it out deliberately for about 24 hours, put it on Barry Clendenin's desk, and uh, it was at room temperature also, and then brought a pacemaker. I said, the Department of Agriculture has over 12,000 inspectors, and they watch those chickens go by. We have heart implanted devices, pacemakers, valves, and there are 1,400 FDA inspectors. I can smell a dead chicken that's rotten. I can't smell anything on a pacemaker or an artificial valve. We need the proper inspections. And when a new initiative comes like follow-on generics, biologics, if it does, my goodness, we can't steal from anything else to leave the protection force undermanned. I would also urge that we have an equal playing ground and playing field for imports versus domestic products. Inspecting at about 3 to 5 percent, getting caught as the cost of doing business. We really need to have high quality foods, drugs, devices, biologics coming into the United States and a good system to make sure that they play on that equal field. Finally, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say finally, I think having the appropriations in agriculture is sort of a historical accident and silly. It would be as silly as having the department's health or having the con Congress's Health and Labor Committee oversee the defense budget. We've now moved to a different era 
where we have a need for having those committees that appropriate health and labor budgets oversee the budget of FDA. This is a major problem. And I think that Congress can have and should have the will to deal with that. There's one other little piece of suggestion that I could humbly make, or maybe not so humbly, that possibly it would be considered to reduce the overlapping authorities that oversee FDA. I think there were about nine different committees that I testified uh, in the over 100 testimonies that I gave. And that was very difficult to go to this committee, this committee, and this committee. If we could have a coordination in oversight, as you're doing today, and focusing the, on the agency from a comprehensive standpoint, I think it would be very, very helpful. Thank you very much, Dr. Young. Those are very helpful and specific uh, ideas, and I appreciate them. They're, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're going to review them very carefully. Dr. Kessler? Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. Most importantly, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your belief and support for the mission of the FDA. The opportunity and challenges this Congress has before it now to equip the Food and Drug Administration to meet the public health challenges of the 21st century are as pivotal as those the Congress faced in 1938 and 1962 when it gave the agency the fundamental responsibility of ensuring drug safety and efficacy. We are seeing a confluence of factors, chronic underfunding, a lack of enforcement authority, severely outdated scientific and regulatory frameworks that are creating a lack of confidence in the FDA and its many dedicated and talented people. At the same time, there are considerable challenges the agency must be able to address if it is to remain the world standard for public health protection. This includes globalization of markets, particularly in food and drugs, and the imminent and profound shift toward a new era in medicine in which treatments are geared toward individuals rather than mass markets. I want to focus, Mr. Chairman, if I may, on uh, food safety. My written remarks address many of the issues that my colleagues uh, have already talked about, but let me focus my oral remarks, if I may, on food safety. Simply put, our food safety system in this country is broken. We have no structure for preventing foodborne illnesses in this country. The reality is that there is currently little mandate, little leadership, little resources, nor scientific research base for prevention, and I underline the word prevention, of food safety problems. The fact is there is no one in the executive branch with the clout and authority who focuses, whose job it is to prevent foodborne illnesses. FDA can react to outbreaks. But the emphasis needs to be on preventing outbreaks before they happen. Over the past 20 years, there has been robust debate about FDA's role in drug approval and safety. The, this focus on drugs also has been reflected in agency funding and management attention. And legislation currently under consideration will continue to strengthen our drug safety system. Now it is time, indeed overdue, to address the same attention and concern to the agency's food safety mission. In 1938, when the statute was written, people were not thinking about food safety in terms of global markets and worldwide supply and distribution networks. Spending weeks or months tracing back cases of foodborne illnesses to their origin, although important, is too much like chasing the horse after it has left the barn, and too often with devastating results in illness and death. Congress and the administration should act urgently to strengthen FDA by meeting its resource needs and by unifying and elevating food safety leadership within FDA and the Department of Health and Human Services. Food safety cannot, cannot compete with drug or device safety for resources and leadership. 
Food safety cannot be delegated to second tier management within the agency. And the fact is that food safety has been a second tier priority within the FDA. In addition, the current structure in the agency for food safety is fragmented. Responsibilities for food are spread across the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, the Center for Veterinary Medicine, and the Office of Regulatory Affairs. There must be clear recognition within HHS that food safety is an essential part of protecting the public health, and it cannot be housed in the Department of Agriculture because the Secretary of Agriculture does not speak for public health. We need a Commissioner of Foods at FDA who is responsible and accountable for all that FDA does on food safety in headquarters and the field, who reports directly to the Secretary. Our focus today needs to be on prevention, not just reaction, if we are to have any hope of averting future failures in the food safety system. FDA must have the scientific capability to do the research and to develop the right processes and controls. Producers and suppliers must be required to take steps to protect their link in the food chain. And the agency must have the authority to hold producers and suppliers accountable for the failure to establish the necessary protections and standards. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your long-standing interest in these issues and your willingness to devote your time and energy and that of the committee to finding a solution to the challenges confronting this very, very important agency. I offer to you whatever help I can to provide you as you work towards strengthening the ability of the FDA and the federal government to continue to protect the health of the American people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kessler. Dr. Von Eschenbach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee. I'm pleased to join you this afternoon for what I know will be a productive discussion of the future of the Food and Drug Administration. I've been at the helm of the FDA as a fully confirmed commissioner for approximately five months, obviously a period of time that pales in comparison to the combined experience of the three former commissioners that I am proud to have sent around me on this panel. But although my tenure at FDA has been brief, I am no stranger to the radical changes, the radical changes in science and technology that over the recent years have transformed the healthcare environment in which the FDA must achieve its mission of protecting and promoting the public health. Whether caring for cancer patients or conducting research or heading the National Cancer Institute, I have witnessed discoveries at the molecular level that are transforming medicine, health care, and are impacting our regulatory environment across the full continuum of food and drugs, biologics, devices, and other consumer products. Now from my current vantage point as commissioner of the FDA, I have the privilege of being able to create and implement a strategic plan that will enable the agency to remain the world's leader and gold standard a record my predecessors can be justifiably proud of. And our focus, therefore, today and our theme is not simply to address repairing the FDA of the old, but most importantly, to build the FDA of the future in the context of the radical changes that are occurring in the world around us. I am committed to leading an FDA that in addition to responding in a visionary and strategic manner to these challenges, will also be effectively and efficiently managed. It must and will be a regulatory agency that is always science-based, but also science-led, and engaged in the full life cycle of the products that we must regulate, whether they are foods, drugs, devices, or commodities. Americans still want the assurance and the security of knowing that life-sustaining and life-enhancing products will be rapidly available to them to promote their well-being, but at the same time, they also want to know that the latest scientific and technological advances are being brought to bear in the prevention and detection of adverse outcomes that could impact their health. To meet these expectations in this radically different and new environment will require a modern FDA that, as my colleagues have indicated, is adequately resourced to fully implement its regulatory authorities and new scientific tools. Since arriving at the FDA, we have worked 
with the FDA staff and leadership to develop a plan for increased resources. And I'm grateful to the Congress for its support in FY 2007 and look forward to the increased resources that are proposed in the President's budget for FY 2008, which will account for an additional $77 million, more than 07. And we are well into formulating a continuation of this trajectory of increases as we formulate our strategic budget proposals for FY09. And I will look forward to continuing to work with all members of Congress during this appropriations process. To address increases in funding, we are also supplementing the taxpayer dollars with increases that are also being proposed as you address reauthorization of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act and the Medical Device User Fee Modernization Act, as well as consideration of additional fees for our ability to continue to manage the increasing demands posed by regulation of generic drugs. Congress is also interested in FDA's legal authorities and whether they need to be altered or increased, and we will continue to contribute to those discussions as well. But however, I believe it is important to not only address how additional essential resources we could use effectively to be able to enhance the authorities that we currently already have. Efficient and effective measures such as guidances and rulemaking can be powerfully uh, important tools when they have the resources to be fully utilized as opposed to unfended mandates and statutes that are ultimately doomed to failure. FDA now has permanent confirmed leadership and organizational changes are occurring that can lead us to greater efficiency and effectiveness. And I pledge that we will continue this effort as we continue to look at the FDA's responsibilities and opportunities and challenges of the future. Some organizational changes that already occurred that address many of the concerns my colleagues have raised, as for example, the appointment of Dr. Janet Woodcock specifically as Deputy Commissioner and FDA's Chief Medical Officer to oversee our scientific portfolio and to be able to lead its modernization and amplification, uh, particularly benefiting from the current effort that's underway by our scientific advisory board to totally reassess the scientific portfolio of the FDA to find greater opportunities for in integration, efficiency, and also the ability to find strategic areas in which we can enhance that scientific effort. She is also responsible for addressing many of the issues with regard to career development of our current staff and most importantly is taking on a very aggressive effort to create an FDA credential training and fellowship program that we expect over the next three to five years will bring approximately 2,000 fellows into the agency. More recently, I named John Dyer a seasoned executive with executive government experience as Deputy Commissioner and Chief Operating Officer. He will bring streamlined management processes to our planning and budgeting for the future. We are also strengthening the agency's infrastructure. A new Chief Information Officer is now in place with the mandate of modernizing FDA's information systems so that we will be equipped and prepared to fully integrate into the rapid changes that are occurring in the healthcare environment where we will in fact have access to databases that are being developed in healthcare infrastructures such as the one that Dr. Kennedy alluded to and therefore be able to provide a rapid, seamless, efficient way of being able to data mine and learn and understand about the utilization of these devices, drugs, biologics and products in the, in the real world. We will continue much of the effort of modernization, even including the opportunities for new facilities that are becoming available to us as we build out our consolidation of much of FDA at our new White Oak campus. And we expect that to per per pay dividends in the synergies and productivity and efficiency of the organization. Mr. Chairman, we at the FDA concur with you that we must focus on the future and address the increasingly emerging challenges, but also the unbelievable exciting opportunities that this new world of science and technology is providing for us, and most importantly, is hoping and offering uh, to the American people and the world for greater solutions to their problems. 
I'm honored to be leading this proud agency whose mission today, tomorrow, and as always as in the past, will be to promote and protect the public health. And I would be pleased to continue this dialogue with you and my colleagues as we explore that new future. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Von Eschenbach. I'll start the um, questioning. Each uh, member will get five minutes uh, on the first round. Um, one of the, uh, I think all of you have done a superb job in giving us a perspective uh, at the FDA. The, the, the job of the FDA is varied. You deal with drugs, devices, food, uh, different products, uh, and there are different issues that come up. Uh, I, I think all of the suggestions are very worthwhile and we want to take them uh, under advisement. I want to pursue one area, and that's enforcement of the rules. Uh, it goes to the heart of FDA's mission. Without a strong enforcement arm, the standards set by the FDA are meaningless, and over the years, experience has proved that a strong FDA enforcement leads to broader compliance with the law. We know when laws are enforced, people are more likely to obey the law. Uh, greater consumer confidence, because the public knows that the law and the rules are being enforced. And improve public health, because that's what the, all the rules are all about, to make sure that the public health is protected. Uh, Dr. Von Eschenbach, uh, I want to ask you about, the first of all, the field staff that's available to do the work of the inspections that are required. I understand that there are um, 3,460 full-time employees at FDA focusing on field inspection activities. Is, is that a correct number? Oh, press pressure button. <laughs> yes, sir. Without having the exact numbers before yeah. me, that is my recollection as well. We have a poster on the uh, side over there. Perhaps uh, you can take a look at it. That poster indicates that there was a sharp increase in field staff at FDA in 2003, and that was after the passage of the Bioterrorism Act, followed by a steep decline. I assume that even though there's been a steep decline, there has not been a reduction in FDA's responsibilities that would uh, explain this decrease. Is that an accurate statement? That's correct, sir. I understand that FDA oversees over 200,000 food establishments in the United States. There are probably at least tens of thousands of other firms, including manufacturers of medical devices or biologics or drugs or animal feed. And uh, that, that means our field, FDA's field staff has got to look at all those establishments as well. Do you, do you know, or maybe you want to provide for the record, how many establishments FDA oversees in each of these categories that I mentioned? I, I cannot give you the breakdown in terms of the categories. We will provide that for you uh, as far as the record is concerned. Thank you. That would be helpful. Well, let's assume I, that all of the field staff were just for food establishments. They're not, but let's say that they were. Um, in 2006, there were... 1,962 field staff, most of whom are inspectors on food programs. Is that a correct statement? Yes. And based on the total number of food establishments in 2006, 210,000, and 1,962 field staff, that translates to roughly one inspector for every 60 food establishments. I understand that in 2006, the total number of field personnel who visit and evaluate all regulated facilities was that 3,460. We know that there are far more regulated firms than food establishments since there are also all of the firms involved in these medical devices, drugs, uh, biologics, animal feed. But even if all of the field staff focused only on food, that would mean only one inspector for every 107 establishments. Um, I, I want to know if you think that's a correct statement. I think your, your statistics are, are very well taken in that, that they point out exactly what the important challenge is going forward. And that is with this large proliferation of sources from which these products come, mm -hmm. uh, what we must do is not simply look at the size of the workforce because it never would be equivalent to that number of, 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 of that large a need. And so therefore the opportunities are how we strategically deploy that workforce. That has been the strategy in terms of, number one, taking a risk management approach where recognizing among that large diversity there is a lot of, of heterogeneity in which some are considered to be of high risk and therefore we focus our inspections on those particular firms and that's based on product, 
the kind of product that they're producing and what level of risk comes from that, prior track record or source in which we know that there may be a concerns. And so I think it's not only the issue of resources, but how those resources are applied strategically in a risk management uh, basis that is an important way of going forward into the future. Do you look at the food uh, side of the FDA responsibility as less risky than the drug or the medical device side? No, sir, absolutely not. And do you, do you develop more resources or less resources to food than you do in the other areas? Well, I think the resources, as I indicated, are being applied strategically. And invest, investigators, field investigators, are applying scientific tools that can, in fact, be applicable under certain circumstances to food. And at other times, they can even be applicable to medical devices. Mm -hmm. And as we're seeing science and technology uh, improve, what we're attempting to do is bring some of those f tools out of the laboratory and into the hands of field inspectors at the point uh, of inspection. And, and therefore, that's an additional part of what you've seen in our uh, proposal this year for our, OR, our Office of Regulatory Affairs reorganization, which is a strategic way of enhancing inspections, the quality of the inspections, better tools for inspection, and focused strategic application of those inspectors to areas where we see concerns regarding risk. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Davis. Over the past year, we've seen a number of stories um, of food contamination, including the nationwide recall of fresh spinach due to E. coli, salmonella and peanut butter, and poisonous pet food. Several of you mentioned in your testimony that FDA is responsible for regulating 80 percent of the food supply while the USDA receives 75 percent of federal food safety budget. How is FDA's food safety program different from USDA's? Mr. Davis, the uh, Food and Drug Administration concentrates uh, its oversight over food uh, for products that have to do with vegetables, produce, and seafood, and the USDA is addressing beef, poultry, and, and certain egg product derivatives. Uh, what we do is work very closely with USDA in a collaborative, cooperative uh, relationship, as well as work effectively with state agencies so that we're addressing that full continuum of is, our is food it, portfolio. Is it, is it efficient or is it very duplicative as they work together? And I guess I asked if FDA had the resources uh, what best practices and authorities would you want to borrow from USDA to create a safer food supply? Well, along with USDA, what we are increasingly addressing is the realization of being engaged in the full life cycle of these products as they are changing radically with regard to how they are being produced and, and distributed. Uh, the chairman has already uh, made reference to the fact that, for example, we are seeing now going from farm to fork in a much more rapid way, the use of fresh uh, products that are eaten in the fresh state rather than cooked. And these are creating new challenges with regard to our ability to assure safety. And so USDA and FDA are both working to address those changes that are occurring in a collaborative way. And we're approaching it of building quality in by working with producers and, in our case, uh, growers, as well as being able to utilize our inspections uh, further on down the line in distribution. Okay. Anybody else want to add anything to that, Mr. Dr. Kessler? Congressman, there have been certain model programs in USDA, for example, the ground beef program, which I think uh, could serve as best practices. Again, it's focused on preventing problems uh, before they start. You know, the I think the American people don't understand um, that if you go in uh, and you order a pizza. Um, that's regulated by FDA, uh, but if you put pepperoni on it, it's the United States Department of Agriculture. And in some ways, that doesn't uh, make sense. Uh, but again, as I think the chairman indicated uh, in his numbers, uh, just and if you, you have a beer with it, you get the alcoholic beverage control on it. So just you know, everybody's. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, the real issue is you're never going. I mean, do you want, right? to be chasing the problem after it happens, or do you want to have a system of preventive controls in place? And that's what uh, USDA, to its credit, did after the jack-in-the-box uh, episode 
a number of years ago. And I think we can learn lessons. But again, the focus has to be on prevention standards. And that's not been at the core of our food safety system uh, to date for the vast majority of products. Okay, now, Dr. Young. Thank you for that question. I think there's another problem that possibly emanates from where the appropriations comes. There is a great imbalance in the amount of inspectional and enforcement authority mm -hmm. in FDA versus agriculture. And as Dr. Kessler absolutely appropriately said, we need to focus on prevention, but with the numbers that are there, it's very difficult to make that initiative work. Okay. Um, let me go to the, the um, how, how prepared is the FDA against the threat of a terrorist attacks on food supply? Have you given any thought of thought to that? Well, are there specific actions and programs FDA has implemented over the past few years? And has FDA partnered with other federal agencies and industry to protect against what we call agro-terrorism? Yes, sir. We have approached the, the food issue from both the food safety perspective, which we've been discussing, and also from food defense, which takes a very specific view of where our vulnerabilities might be to intentional uh, contamination as opposed to unintentional. Uh, that has been done uh, in collaboration with a variety of other federal agencies. Uh, we have adapted models that have been developed in the Department of Defense, uh, referred to as the shock uh, carver, uh, carver shark shock models to begin to understand vulnerabilities that occur uh, within our food chain and w how they need to be addressed from the point of view of protection against what would be considered a terrorist uh, intentional effort to harm uh, our food supply. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Um, Mr. Um, Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. This has been very, very interesting, especially in light of uh, what has happened with uh, the, the pet food uh, issue in China and how uh, imported foods aren't inspected. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on, on that a little more and what you would recommend uh, to, to Congress to do about this, because this was very disturbing. It was very open. Uh, in China and for people who uh, even scratch the surface on how there's little or no inspection and how they've had many, many failures in the past. And then, Dr. Kennedy, if you could um, uh, elaborate a little more on uh, antibiotics resistance, especially with what we're seeing um, with HIV and tuberculosis and the extreme resistance uh, to some of the uh, antibiotics. Mr. With regard to your important question, I want to echo a theme that Dr. Kessler has emphasized, and that is the issue of prevention. And I, as I indicated to the chairman, whether it's food or drugs, the FDA is taking an approach of the full life cycle of that product. And we have been addressing the need to build quality in with regard to the production of food. So not only issuing good agricultural practices for growers within our own borders, within the United States, We've been working with foreign countries, their governments, as well as their uh, producers to begin to help assure quality of those products at those sites of production. Because we've seen a continuous increase in the amount of food that's imported uh, into this country uh, each year. And so we're attempting to provide those good agricultural practices work with the governments, engage in inspections in terms of how these products are being produced, and create corrective measures at the very front end as a preventative strategy, and then uh, well, apply uh, the risk management to our borders. Doctor, I, I heard that all in the testimony. I think Dr. Young was going, was going to, to say something. When, when you go to a grocery store and you pick something up, in a United States grocery store, as a consumer, you already feel that you have the assurance. So telling me that you're going to try to provide assurances uh, d doesn't, doesn't make me uh, feel much, uh, much better. Dr. Young, you look like you had something you wanted to contribute. One of the major drawbacks, in my opinion, is the inability to adequately certify 
that the inspectional capability, the regulatory capability of the country of origin is similar to or equivalent to our country. This is a real problem, and I think you hit the nail on the head by focusing on the pet food uh, concern. If the standards are not comparable, and we have a low level of inspection when these products come into the United States, then it truly is a canary in the cage. And it's not dealing with the front end prevention. And we need to be able to negotiate these international type regulatory treaties. We have some very good ones in good manufacturing practices, in drugs. We have some others in regards to devices. The food area has not been focused on as well, and as you aptly pointed out, more and more is coming from different countries that may not have, and in fact do not have, the same standards of inspection that the United States does. This loophole needs to be plugged. I think you asked a question about antibiotic resistance, Ms. McCullough. Thanks. Um, with respect both to uh, uh, multi multiply resistant uh, 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 bacteria, uh, Staphylococcus particularly, uh, vancomyc vancomycin resistance in endotoxin. There's, there's dramatic growth even since 1985 in the proportion of, of hospitals that are reporting uh, unmanaged infections. As somebody once said to me, it's really, the, the good news is that your surgery went beautifully and everything is, is safe and it's wonderful. The bad news is you have an infection against which we have no treatment. Uh, what can be done at the supply side end of that is to offer some real incentives to drug manufacturers to get back into that business because it has dropped steadily over the past 10 to 15 years. And one way of doing that would be if the Congress saw fit to engage with it in, in a statutory fashion by creating a specifically tailored organ, orphan drug kind of exemption for an antibiotic that could replace an antibiotic that was, al that was already uh, encountering substantial uh, resistance in, 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 in the target bacteria. It would have to be so limited, that is, you could, couldn't offer it carte blanche to anybody who developed a new antibiotic, but there ought to be some special intellectual property rewards for somebody who goes after uh, an antibiotic that can replace one to which there is resistance. Could I add one additional point to that question? Yes, Dr. Young. One of the things that I've learned in my more recent activities in the industrial side of the marketplace is that the companies that are looking for a return on their investment, which is frequently the taxpayer's investment in insurance funds and others, gauge what the agency is doing and what is likely to be difficult to get evaluation expeditiously and what is likely to be hard. So there's a marketplace that I must tell you is already shifting to devices from early startup biotech companies. So the very thing that Dr. Kennedy is talking about in areas that are judged to be risky, the private equity funds and the venture funds are decreasing. And part of that relates to what I tried to point out is the difficulty in understanding what these overlapping rules are and where the incentives are. And that, again, is a topic that I strongly support what Dr. Kennedy said is extraordinarily critical in the field of antibiotics. We could list off, and if you'd, have, be, if you'd like to, I'll tick off about 10 other areas that we really need to look at that are high need, and similarly uh, are problems in regards to the regulatory structure. Thank you, Ms. McCollum. Um, Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to um, give you back some of the statements that some of you all have made and then ask you if you could respond to them and then um, 
ask a, a general question, I guess. Um, have all of any of you or all of you made these same kinds of recommendations in the past and are there reports, those of you who were formerly there, are there reports that uh, we could get our hands on showing that you've made these same kind of recommendations for improvements at the FDA? If you could just answer me yes or no and then give us the dates on those reports or approximate dates and let our staff find them. Uh, Dr. Young? Yes, it's difficult to give you the reports because we don't take documents out of the, well, the government. I understand, but, but, but yes, you, you could give the general period of what was focused on, yes. And could you do that today? Yes. Not, not necessarily now, but if you could do it now. I'd be happy to do it for the do record. Okay, Dr. Kessler. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Congresswoman, um, I testified uh, on Food Safety Enforcement Authority several uh, times and would be happy to provide you uh, with those references. And. And let me ask you, did you say then that the food safety system is broken? Um, I don't believe I did um, quite in as stark uh, terms. I'd have to go back and, and review my uh, testimony and refresh my recollection. I believe I said uh, the tools were significantly outmoded. Uh, in fact, we were dealing with tools that were enacted close to a century ago and not for the current uh, environment. But I think uh, recent events have, have shown us um, that the problems continue uh, to persist, uh, and they really do require our attention. And Dr. Kennedy. My associates were kind enough to count while I was commissioner, and I testified 47 times. And I do believe that uh, at least six or seven of them dealt primarily with foods, and I think I could probably dig them up. Okay. Uh, let, me, um, let me ask you um, a question. How much money do you all think it would, it would take to guarantee a fail-safe program? You indicate that that's possible to have so what would you predict would it cost to have a fail-safe food safety program in this country? Dr. Kennedy, start with you since you answered last. I think the, I think the candid answer has to be more money than you've got. Uh, okay. I, I don't believe in, 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 in perfect safety. Uh, uh, we, used to, we used to argue with Congressman Delaney that Probably it wasn't a good idea to insist on complete safety. And so I think we could tailor a system that would be substantially improved and that it would reduce the risk level, but I think it would not reduce it to zero. Dr. Kessler? I agree uh, with Dr. Kennedy. There, there will be no uh, fail safe system uh, with no. I think your mic is off. Press it again. There will be no system that assures 100 percent safety. I think as Dr. Kennedy um, taught me years ago, the real mission of FDA is to create the incentives for the purveyor of the product to produce as safe a product as possible. That's really what uh, okay. FDA is all Thank about. Thank you, Dr. Young. Dr. Young, would you? Again, there's no absolute safety. I believe that the budgets can be projected to reduce risk. Happy to provide information. Okay. What, with your comments, though, you all indicate that throwing money at this issue would provide such a program. And that was why I wanted to ask you that, because it always is that if we'll just put more money, more money, more money into agencies, then we can get results. And, and I'm always interested that if we have a, a responsible and accountable person, I think uh, Dr. Kessler said, who reports to the secretary, then you can guarantee a safe program. I, I don't think that in our, in our bureaucracy we ever really have people lose their jobs because of lack of performance or, or that are get really held responsible. And what I'd be curious in the reports that you might have made before is did you 
set up an organization in such a way that people would be held responsible. Because in the bureaucracy, we don't do that. And I believe that unless we devise a system where people individually are held responsible at every step of the way for a certain level of performance, that no amount of money is going to create the kind of system you're talking about. And what I'm interested in is you all, in the jobs you have and, and the current person, are those the kinds of recommendations you're making? Because again, just putting money into it without standards, performance standards, we're not going to have it. And I, last question I would ask you, and I just, um, I guess, ask for a yes or no. Do you think it's possible we could have food inspection treaties with other countries? Uh, would you make that as a recommendation? Okay. If I could respond first. When I was commissioner, we had the opportunity uh, in the biotechnology revolution, and we made those treaties through OECD and through WHO, where I was a representative for the United States in both. In regards to GMP, those initiatives were, were done at that time. Dr. Kessler and others continued them. We have not had the same focus on imports as it relates to foods. And one of the problems that we have is we are bringing in uh, products, and unless we have these treaties, unless we have an inspection that goes with them, I don't think it'll work. I also tried to say that the agency requires more than a bandage of additional resources as important as they are. And I tried to focus on the need to address this incredibly bad swinging door that we've had at FDA. That's been a real difficulty because there is not a, con a continuity of leadership. But in the last point that I would say, yes, there have been people that have lost their jobs. I'll just give you two prominent ones. And I'll go back in history rather than, than uh, current. But the assistant secretary who oversaw the swine flu problem, that was Dr. Ted Kennedy, lost his job. And at that time, the head of CDC uh, lost his job. The secretary had the cranberry bog problem. Uh, we've had others. And there are a lot of difficulties uh, that people have had along the way. The problem isn't accountability as much as it is the ability to build a system that is proactive in a culture to make a secure environment where people can make a decision without fear of political punishment. And I'm talking about regardless of whether it's a Democratic administration or whether it's a Republican administration. But those issues can paralyze an agency Without a commissioner, it's even more striking. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Fox. Did, did any of the others of you want to comment on her question? Well, if I just, Mr. Chairman, if I can add, uh, I both agree and disagree with Dr. Kessler. I agree, uh, disagree that our food system is broken, uh, but I agree that we will never have a totally 100% fail-safe. So the approach for the FDA going forward is to be collaborative, cooperative with all the other parts of this equation in our food chain, to work with growers, to apply our protection at the borders, to work with USDA as we embrace models like the HACCP model or the hazard analysis that he referred to, and to see this as a system solution to a systems problem, but the FDA providing the leadership and the integrating force, but not see this as simply solved by just an inspection issue or just uh, a, a trade treaty issue, but a real comprehensive approach uh, that I think is really ultimately the best assurance to the American people that what they take home and feed to their children is in fact safe. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Brayling. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to thank our panelists for appearing today. Uh, Dr. Young, you made a comment. I think drug safety, a drug safety program is absolutely essential. Yes. What I'd like to do is, for the panel, sort of review where we've come from in the last eight years. In 1999, the Institutes of Medicine, which most of you have referred to, issued this report to Air as Human, building a safer health system. And at that time, they projected that somewhere between 44,000 and 98,000 people die in hospitals every year due to preventable medical errors. In March of 2001, the IOM issued another report, Crossing the Quality Chasm, a new health system for the 21st century. 
Then in 2003, the IOM issued patient safety, achieving a new standard for care, which had recommendations not only for agencies of the federal government, but also for Congress to make proactive steps to improve patient safety, especially in the area of medication errors. And then just this year, the IOM released preventing medication errors. And what I'd like to know is whether we've actually made any tangible progress in reducing the 7,000 deaths per year identified in those earlier reports due to medication errors by adapting some of the technologies and recommendations, or do we still have as far to go as it sounds like we do in achieving real tangible benefits in the era of patient safety from drug interactions? I fundamentally think that we have a long way to go. When we do the pre-market evaluation, at most we're looking at three to 5,000 patients, and we derive a basic assessment of safety. After that, we do not have a comprehensive system that looks at medicines, makes a judgment of which ones we should study that year, and then gets the denominator and the numerator. Unfortunately, the numbers that you cited are probably low. I think it's a closer to 100,000 a year that have adverse medical responses. Now, there's a couple of things that I should bring out. One is today's medicines are very complicated. I very fortunately had a bypass in 2000. I did not die like my father did at his first and only coronary at 45 years of age. I take about five or six different cardiovascular medicines. I am very careful about those drug-drug interactions. I read the fine print that come out on these, but I have no way of saying is it right for me to take a particular generic model against what I'm taking as the Innovator brand, because I know the Innovator brand works, and I don't have a large system that I can say, yes, 500,000 people took this drug with a combination of this drug and there was no adverse effect. We don't have these large numbers. We need that. That's why I said it's essential and a user fee may have to be done. And let, let me add this comment so the rest of the panel can also consider this. Two of the recommendations in the 2003 patient safety report were improvement of computer detection rules using Boolean search terms and also data mining free text searches for the exact same problems you're talking about. And yet my perception from talking to public health officials is that with the possible exception of some advancements made in our VA electronic medical management system, that the, the, by and large the general public is not that much safer from these type of recommendations being implemented in the real world than we were in 2003. Can anyone comment? Congressman, I think that there's a lot of science, um, and that's the good news, um, that will make uh, our pharmaceuticals much safer. One of the problems we've had over the last several years um, and the industry has had it, um, is this issue of the push for the blockbuster. And when a blockbuster means you're going to have a drug that sells to as many people, literally millions and millions uh, of people. And what we need, and we're finally getting um, the scientific base to figure out the right drug for the right person, for the right indication at the right dose. That's what personalized medicine is all about. If I sell a drug right, to 100 million people, right, but only 1 million people are going to benefit, right, we have to change the system. We ha and we're beginning to have the tools to understand who's going to benefit and understand that up front. Now, that's going to take a lot of resources, and I think it's also going to require the FDA to lead in this area. Let me, just, let me just offer this observation about that comment. I mean, one of the problems that I hear repeatedly on how we reduce patient, preventable patient errors is that it's not a people problem, it's a system problem. The system problems have been identified for a long time, and yet I'm not hearing that we're making dramatic progress in institution-wide implementation of improvements to address the system failures. 
So that's the concern I'm raising and where are we going and what are the possible solutions that Congress plays in giving health care providers the resources they need to eliminate the system breakdowns. Can, can I try one? Please. I think, uh, I think one thing that the Congress could do, uh, and I, I think it will not be uncontroversial, is to make a requirement that, that there be an additional form on every prescription written in the United States that must go into a database with no patient's name but with the, with the dosage. And, and that provides the, the denominator base for looking at the number of adverse incidents and discovering what the rate is. Because unless you have a rate, you can't know. Then the other thing Congress can do is to follow the IOM recommendation in its most recent report by uh, providing authority for FDA to allow limited marketing under certain conditions. You can't do direct consumer advertising in this particular drug. In the other one, there's a labeling requirement that we have to initiate. I think, uh, I think that giving those additional authorities would, would uh, solve some of the sim uh, systems problems. Thank you. Congressman, I agree that we've got a long way to go because health, the healthcare community has been slow to adopt electronic uh, infrastructure in healthcare. But at the same time, I think we're traveling that road much more rapidly today than we ever have in the past. And you're seeing the transition into healthcare of technologies that have been developed in other areas like the banking industry, et cetera. Now, FDA must participate in that transition to that new future. And part of what we are doing is, is now, as I indicated, immersing much more in post-market surveillance and engaging and staying engaged in what happens to those drugs when they're used in the real world, uh, as Dr. Young pointed out, where there's multiple drug interactions. Working with the VA, working with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, working with some of the private health care delivery systems that are creating these electronic medical record databases and using the kind of modern tools that you alluded to for data mining and benefiting from experience that's come from organizations such as Google, uh, et cetera. I think we're traveling that road much more rapidly today than we could have five or 10 years ago uh, when we didn't have those technologies. And I anticipate FDA playing a very important role in this post-market surveillance opportunity to get to the point where we identify the earliest signals of potential problems and intervene so as we protect uh, the lives of people who might otherwise uh, be damaged. Thank you, Mr. Braley. Thank you. Mr. Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, am, I can't tell you guys, or you gentlemen, how honored I am to be here with you. I've followed your work uh, when all of you were in, in office, and uh, I'm particularly a big fan of Dr. Eschenbach, who I've spent some time with. And, and I've always thought that you've had the hardest job on the face of the earth. You have to, you have to guarantee people safety when uh, people do, among other things, stupid human things. Um, I, I, Dr. Eschenbach, do you know how many drugs were approved by FDA last year, new drugs? New molecular entities, obvious. I'm sorry. You can bellow it out. <laughs> You're on. Hold up your finger. I think we, um, I would answer that for you. For the record, my recollection is we had 12 new drug applications, four biologic uh, license applications. And, and how many of those were, that were approved? Yes, sir. Sorry. Approved. Um, I, I'm going to lecture a little bit, but it, it will lead to a question, I assure you. Uh, but I'd like to set the stage. We, we've talked about several things that I think are very important. Ms. Fox talked about food safety and whether or not we could have a perfect system. The answer is, of course, we couldn't have a perfect system, but we could have a system that is order of uh, orders of magnitudes better using the new technologies that are available and, and tracking data and uh, using computers that are, are substantial. Uh, and maybe even lowering the cost using techniques like uh, Google has pioneered. Um, uh, Dr. Young talked about large numbers of drugs and how they interact. Uh, and uh, also, uh, as Dr. Kennedy talked about, uh, a database of all the drugs to see what those interactions are. The fact is these are things we can talk about today because we have, in fact, I think the gentleman from uh, Iowa talked about a Boolean search. I'm going to go a step farther and talk about Bayesian statistics. 
uh, Bayesian statistics being, of course, the, the uh, finding correlations in complex data. And, and that's really where you get, but this is a discussion we could have today. We couldn't have had it five years or even three years ago, probably. Uh, and so I, I want to set the stage by saying that we are now in a different time and we're at a, at a point where we're doing very few drugs, if I can characterize 12 as that, that way. Uh, go, go ahead, Mr. Eschenbach, Dr. Eschenbach. I, I please correct the record. I was giving you the priority approvals, and I apologize. Yeah. The overall was 97 new drug applications oh, yeah. and four biologics, so 101 oh. total, of which what I gave you were priority accelerated right. approvals, so I apologize. Um, but in an environment, even 100 is, is a relatively small number given uh, what uh, several people were at least, I think Dr. Kessler, you referred to as personalized medicine. And, uh, you know, I, I, this is a remarkably important issue, I think, to us as policymakers. And it's not partisan, I think, Dr. Young, as you pointed out. These issues are very complex. I don't mean to simplify them. But we are in a complex environment with hugely more capable tools to deal with complexity. So uh, Bert Rutan just got the X Prize, $10 million for going to suborbital orbital flight twice within a week. The next X Prize is for the company that can uh, uh, decode an individual's DNA for $1,000. Now, I suspect that most people in this room will get their DNA decoded if we get to the point where the price is that cheap. But that means that we can actually really, truly personalize medicine and know why something that didn't work for Dr. Kennedy did work for Dr. Young, and maybe if we have 100 people who've used a similar combination of the medicines that Dr. Young is taking, why some of those people work or, or perform better or work better with those drugs than other people. And that's where, we, where we, we need to get. And FDA, as an organization, has a difficulty getting there, it seems. And that's the, the, the core of the question that I want to get to. But um, let me just take it a little further. You know, you've got, you've got uh, Merck out there that pled guilty recently to uh, promoting an off-label use of a drug, and my understanding is I think it's uh, GlaxoSmithKline is now being sued by a plaintiff uh, whose spouse may not have died if they'd made known an off-label use of uh, one of their drugs that would have saved uh, uh, the spouse. Uh, is there not a way uh, that we can take advantage of these massive changes, the, the vast decrease in the cost of, of millions of instructions per second on, on a computer, and the vast decrease in the cost of decoding DNA uh, and the vast vastly reduced cost of tracking food products so that we can make orders of magnitude improvement in where we're going. And in fact, Dr. Eschenbach first, and then let me just ask the other members of the panel, is it not possible to set up a system so that a doctor can suggest a protocol which may include a complicated set of drugs or an, or an off-label use of a drug that is, becomes a standard and that the market then allows to become a standard and to be used, and that allows us to do what Dr. Kennedy was suggesting, which is track how drugs interact. Is it not possible to create a system where we, where we know the toxicity of a drug, and so some, uh, an agency like the FDA could say uh, that is a dangerous or it is not a dangerous protocol, and if it's not a dangerous protocol, allow us to track the data in a Bayesian context and, and therefore make these orders of magnitude leaps forward where we find out that there's actually a difference between Dr. Young's chemistry and my DNA, and therefore I can't take the same set of drugs, uh, but, but maybe Mr. Isa can. Uh, let, let me go to Dr. Uh, Eschenbach first, and well, I'd love to have all your, your comments on that. Thank you, Mr. Ken. You've touched on a number of very important issues that are part of our critical path initiative to address this entire spectrum of how we can begin to accelerate our ability to regulate these drugs while both assuring their safety and their efficacy. So we build scientific tools in at the very front end, as Dr. Young has indicated, so we understand the patient from a genetic and molecular point of view and the drug and can understand both the impact as it relates to benefit and potential risk. But then at the same time, adaptive trial designs, the kind of opportunities you're addressing in terms of looking at that drug and how it behaves in populations can be also improved and, and be able to get information in real time to, able, to be able to adjust our subsequent protocols. And then finally, the ability to have the information tools that we were speaking of just a few minutes ago to be able to monitor what's happening in, in, in the utilization of those drugs in off-label use by physicians who are in practice adds the third piece of, the, uh, of a full cycle from the very production to the very utilization of those drugs where we can con continuously enhance uh, our effectiveness and yet assure a uh, minimum degree of risk. 
I see, Mr. Chairman, that my time has expired, but I would like to hear from the rest of the panel. But would the chair indulge me by making, allowing me to make a very short refinement to the question? That is, you Please. talked about trial design. And what I'm suggesting is that in a world where people live and are complicated, if we create a system where we can track data, say as through a protocol that is not created as a scientific design, but, but actually tracks what people are doing, doesn't that get us significantly beyond the, the yeah. rigid paradigm of FDA? Right. As a clinical practice protocol for which, like with the CMS database, we're getting the data as that's being done and analyzing it would be a very important step. Yes. Um, if anyone else, Dr. Young, you want to respond to the I just want to make a quick response on one medicine, 5-fluorouracil, that is used in very commonly in cancer treatment. Recently, there has been a development of a test called single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP. It has been discovered that there are 22 SNPs of different types, three of which can predict which individuals are likely to get severe neurological complications. I had to manage one patient. Uh, who was a friend who had a, uh, was in a coma for two months after taking this medicine because she had a genetic abnormality and could not metabolize a 5-fluorouracil. Now that's available. That's what we've been talking about with personalized medicine. But the incentives to switch the market and the incentives to be able to analyze this need to be built in. It's going to be even more complicated when we look between the difference between foods and what foods are tolerated versus what aren't. The Congress needs to address, the administration needs to address this whole development of science and give it adequate resources to make it really work and incentives to drive the marketplace. Dr. Congressman, Dr. Kessler. It, it, it's, it's called the field of pharmacogenomics. Uh, and it's, it's evolving, and, and you articulated it uh, very well. Understand how profoundly it's going to change the pharmaceutical uh, industry. Because no longer are you going to be able um, to sell a drug um, uh, just to thousands and thousands uh, of patients. We're going to be able to target who's going to benefit, who's going to have the adverse reactions. That means, in some ways, smaller markets and perhaps even higher cost drugs. But it's going to have a major influence mm -hmm. uh, on our pharmaceutical industry. And I think some of the pains you see today that the industry is uh, experiencing is being able to uh, gear up for that change. And one of the most important things is how FDA can help lead in the policy formation with the Congress on this. Thank you very much. Dr. Uh, Kennedy did, may uh, I just say in, in closing, Mr. Chairman, uh, <laughs> since I don't think Dr. Kennedy wanted to respond particularly, but we have billions of doses taken annually around the world of medications. If we can start tracking what is happening now, that is a vast improvement. That, that's orders of magnitude in reduction of the time and understanding it will be to get to that point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate your sustained focus on these important issues. And I would also like to thank Dr. Kessler in particular for fighting the good fight against DTC ads. I'm sorry you didn't win that battle, but um, you were pursuing the right cause. We were talking a moment ago about pharmacogenomics. Um, I'd like to ask about pharmacoeconomics, comparative effectiveness. And I hate to even bring this up in, before an agency that's so overworked and underfunded. But it seems to me that consumers need a reliable guide for value in the marketplace, especially when they're confronted with $5 billion worth of DTC ads uh, on our broadcast television. I have countless doctors come up to me complaining about these 30-second experts who, because they've seen a beautiful couple on TV, they didn't hear any of the warnings that were broadcast, but they want some of that, whatever it is. Uh, that seems to me to um, not promote uh, the healing process. What's the best way for us to pursue comparative effectiveness? Is FDA an appropriate agency? Should we do it another way? I know folks like Gail Walensky have been talking about this because safety and efficacy is one step of the process, but finding value for your money is another. Anyone? Congressman, I think um, what FDA is very good at is the science. And I think that's something that I strongly believe, and I, my guess is my colleagues think that's what the FDA should focus on. When it comes to two drugs, right, and one has a riskier adverse event profile than the other, 
That is something that I think FDA should and does deal with. I don't think today FDA has the tools, nor necessarily you would want the FDA to go beyond safety. It's, it's an important policy judgment for the Congress. But once you start allowing economic uh, judgments to be made, not that they're not important, they're vitally important. What good is it if we get drugs out, uh, I mean, for people who work, that we discover them and people can't afford them? So it's vitally important. The question really is, is FDA the right place for uh, those decisions to be made? Dr. Young. Thank you for that very thoughtful question. I would submit, as Dr. Kessler did, that this is not the place that it should be made. Once you start changing the scientific risk-benefit analysis and the safety profile and start doing the economics, I think you're compromising your standards. Uh, I also think, as a person who strongly opposed direct-to-consumer advertisement when it hit its head up on, on my watch, I think that's something that ought to be looked at and some, some guidelines be put into place because you want the professional guidance primarily influencing what is helpful, safe, and effective for a patient and not a wide manipulation of the market, particularly as we're going to more personalized medicine. That makes it much more complicated. How about the more limited case of one chemical compound that's virtually identical to another, a so-called Me Too drug? Is it appropriate for FDA to say that really has no therapeutic benefit or the number needed to treat is so small that it's really virtually identical? I don't think you can say that yet. Uh, I'll go back to my own personal example. I'm on a number of medicines. I am very careful as to what I switch to because I might have a, a polymorphism that this drug is slightly different and it doesn't work for me as I tried to answer in the question of 5-FUDR. So I think that question is, is not quite ripe for exploitation at this time, as important as it is. On another topic, Dr. Kennedy brought up the important issue of hospital-borne infections. People want to know that the hospital is a safe place to go. It's my understanding that nosocomial infections have been, you know, about 15 percent for years. But if we were to have a sudden resurgence of um, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, that could dramatically increase. You mentioned giving a prize or incentive for the discovery of a better antibiotic. But aren't there multiple issues here? First, many of our physicians have overprescribed existing antibiotics. Uh, there are so many antibiotic soaps and feed for cattle and things like that that have worn down our resistance. And then the simple issue of hand washing and facilities. Many of our health providers have not taken the time out to uh, cleanse themselves properly between patients. So, doesn't that all lead to this buildup of antibiotic resistance? Antibiotics are really a unique drug in the following sense, that when you prescribe one to a particular patient, the cost-benefit ratio is not limited to that patient because there are external costs that are spread to the rest of the population. And I think educating doctors about that is, is terribly important. I think, I think that besides encouraging the, the the supply side to develop new antibiotics where there, there's clear evidence that they're needed because there's a lot of resistance already. The other thing is, is to encourage, and I think probably CDC is the target here, as a routine hospital procedure to do a diagnostic sample quickly on all new entering patients so that you will know if even the healthy ones are carrying a little bit of Staphylococcus that's, that's known to be, that can be detected to be antibiotic resistant. And they can be either housed separately or, or, or dealt with in a, in a different way. That would knock down the likelihood that future increases in antibiotic resistance are going to produce an increase in nosocomial infections. I see that my time has expired. If the good doctor could just answer the question, how much would that entry test cost per patient? Um, uh, I haven't costed it out, so I can't give you a responsible economist's answer. I'm told that it's very, it's very inexpensive, but I, I don't want to uh, 
I'll be hung on that. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Um, Mr. Duncan. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I had other meetings, and I've just been here for about a half an hour, so I apologize if, if this has been uh, covered already. But uh, uh, I read in our briefing memo that uh, food imports have quadrupled just since 1999, and they're now in the almost uncountable billions. And then there's a story in the Washington Post this morning that says about 99% of imported foods are simply acknowledged by computer and waved ashore. And it goes on to say, but processed ingredients are often nondescript. And in China, where a national passion for commerce has far outpaced the adoption of regulatory controls, marketers have repeatedly been called adulterating such products, spiking pig feed with diet pill chemicals to make uh, swine leaner, for example, and hiding uh, sawdust in fish meal. And we've heard reports in the last few days about uh, Chinese uh, uh, products uh, being involved in, in the uh, pet food uh, controversy and the, the product melamine that's used in plastic uh, production. And then this morning as I was driving in, I heard a news report saying that uh, now it's been discovered that uh, uh, this uh, Chinese uh, melamine and perhaps other products have been uh, placed in uh, chicken feed and, uh, on four huge farms in Indiana and, and that it may be in as many as millions of, of chickens now. And what I'm wondering about, I'm wondering about the situation with China and, and, and Dr. Van Eschbach, uh, when you find out that a country is doing crooked things, uh, illegal or what should be illegal or immoral type activities. Do, have, have you given any instructions to increase the inspections or the testing of some of these food imports from China? Let's talk about China specifically. Or do you intend to, to increase the inspections on Chinese imports? The Congressman, with regard to your uh, specific question, uh, we do have now the opportunity for what is known as prior notice. So every shipment of, of food and products coming into this country, ha we have to be notified ahead of time about that food shipment. And the shipper or the source is a, has to be registered with the, the FDA. So that gives us a database in which we can begin to determine where we may see areas of risk and concern in areas where we have highly reliable and proven track records of, of confidence. And we will focus on those areas. So in the case of, of, of what you're alluding to specifically with regard to the pet food, obviously where there were two companies within China that embarked upon a practice that led to the adulteration of the melamine into uh, material that would be subsequently used for pet food, we would clearly um, target those, those companies are, are prohibited and blocked from bringing product into the country now. We're, and we've even gone beyond that to look at the whole family of products having to do with vegetable proteins and we're retaining those and inspecting those. So we have a both proactive as well as a responsive strategy to continue to um, focus on areas where we need to enhance protection. Well, I think that uh, based on what I've uh, heard this morning and what I've read in this uh, post story that it's, it goes beyond pet food and now it's gone into the animal feed and maybe into the human yeah. food supply. And I can tell you that I think a lot of people are going to be concerned about this. I think the American people would appreciate a labeling program so they would know where some of this food was coming from, yeah. but, I, but uh, we've been unable to do that uh, in any effective way. So I suppose we can't do that. So we have to rely on the FDA and on your food safety programs. But uh, I think when we just get slapped in the face with the, uh, from the same country over and over and over again that uh, there needs to be some special attention paid to these imports, uh, particularly from China. Apparently that's where we're getting the largest volume of food imports by far anyway. So I think that the inspections and testing on these Chinese imports should be picked up substantially. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Would the gentleman yield? Sure. Uh, following up on that, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Etchenbach, the, uh, the FDA failed to 
prevent, and I'm a California member like the chairman, prevent the loss of a billion dollars to the spinach industry, even though we had a registered user, which was the source, the single source for the E. coli from a single field. Uh, do you want to answer not only the, uh, Mr. Duncan's point, but also perhaps mine, on that point of what are you doing, even when you have registration, in order to make it quick and sure that we know what's good and what's not good? Yes, sir. And specifically with regard to the issue uh, and the difference having to do with spinach, as that process evolved, our first and foremost responsibility was to protect public health. And at the outset, because of the fact that we're seeing significant changes in our distribution processes, where a small a product coming from one source gets rapidly disseminated into a variety of distribution pathways. As we were tracking that outbreak backwards before we even knew where the sole source was, we put out an advisory with regard to all spinach so that we would be assured that we were doing the utmost to protect the American people. Once we began to define where that source was and that the rest of the supply was in fact um, free of any contamination, uh, then it was important to identify the single source and we have not done as good a job with regard to recovery as I think we need to with regard to our communications going forward and that's one of the lessons learned and one of the areas where we are embarking upon opportunities for improvement so that we can do exactly what you have requested, rapidly define the source and not only take action against that, but assure the American people that other options are safe and appropriate, and we're working on that. It's your turn. <laughs> you did. And then I oh, you went right to my time. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank, I thank the chairman. Uh, well, well Dr. Kessler wanted to respond. No, it's great. Uh, I, guess, I guess I'll follow up quickly on that then. I hear you, but I'm disappointed that you couldn't say, and maybe you can say in a follow-up, if we had it to do over again, we would have told the American people with an abundance of caution, we're concerned about all spinach, even though we have isolated so far the outbreaks to a single farm. That was never said on the front end, and it destroyed an industry. Well, let me be clear about what I tried to, to, to say. We had to make the announcement about our concern about spinach before we had the confidence and knowledge of what that single source was. That information did not come. Uh, Doctor, I appreciate that, but unfortunately it flies in the face of past experience. We have had ground beef E. coli in the past. Nobody said, don't eat any ground beef. Nobody said, ground beef is tainted. Even when we had multiple outbreaks, the assumption from day one was always it probably comes from one source, we've isolated no source or one source. You've got a history of a lot of outbreaks of ground beef contamination. It's, it's, it's practically a seasonal occurrence. And you have never done it in a way that destroyed ground beef. Certainly some people got scared and they didn't listen that it was only two pound packs bearing the name of something or other. But the fact is you destroyed an industry by the ineptness of the response. And I would hope that when you're answering a, a congressional inquiry, that you say, look, not only did we have lessons learned, but this is how we would prevent this specifically in the future, not we're trying to develop systems to prevent it. You didn't need to scare the diseases out of everyone who ate anything green and uncooked, and yet that's what happened. The, the production, not just of, of that, but of lettuce and lots of other things went down. And perhaps I'm sensitive because I'm a Californian, but the fact is, it is an important lesson that has to be learned because the next time, if it's ground beef and you treat it that way, we're going to have, what, all beef not eaten for a period of time? Well, your point's well taken, Congressman, but I, I want to emphasize the fact that as we have been talking about today, we're seeing radical and rapid changes occurring in both production and distribution and dissemination of our food supply. And when it it is apparent to us that that potential contamination could affect the entire product. We need to warn the American people of that. And then as we progress with our investigation okay. and get further refined information, 
communicate that effectively to them as well I, I as part of the recovery. I think we're going to agree to disagree and I'll move on. Uh, you know, uh, the FDA has, has dramatically increased the number of medical guide books or leaflets that have to be given out, and yet my understanding is you've, you've not allowed it to come into the 21st century where a pharmacist could take an online database that is more accurate than a printed leaflet, print it out directly and hand it to the individual rather than maintaining leaflets. Are you in the process? Can we have an assurance that that's going to happen in the near future? Yes, sir. We are in that process. One, the changes we made this year with regard to drug label uh, were specifically intended to help move us more effectively into real-time updates in an electronic format of that drug label with the expectation they ultimately could be distributed by pharmacists at the point of service. Okay, and in closing, Dr. Young, I just want to thank you for your comments uh, about the specifics of drugs and how very small differences in even conventional pharma and certainly in follow-on biologics can make a difference and why we cannot simply substitute one for the other even if they're dramatically similar. I yield back and thank the Chairman. Mr. Platts. Mr. Chairman. Could I, could I make a brief comment? I apologize. I didn't mean to cut the joke. Oh, yes, uh, Dr. Young. I wanted to point out one thing, uh, and, and this is different than the question that you asked Dr. Van Essenbach, but related. One of the problems that you had in a crisis, and I had the crisis of the Chilean grapes. We were able to take it off and bring it on in 18 days. But the thing that was key for me was the ability to have regional labs that are well equipped and are able to go in at that site and do the testing and narrow it down as fast as possible. Once you do have a disaster, as Dr. Von Essenbach said, you have to throw everything at it, make the risk, but you try to bring it back on as fast as you can. But unless there's good laboratories in the region that are able to look at that and deal with it, and I would ask Mr. Chairman that you might want to take a look. I have no idea what the laboratory personnel is, but take that same 10-year period of time and look and see where we are in regional lab and the ability of the FDA labs to work and support the Commissioner's office. Thank you. Dr. Kessler, do you want to respond? Uh, Congressman, I, I, I think we have an obligation, um, the three of us, uh, to push back a little here, um, if, if I may. I think you, you, you're making the case. I mean, I am a Californian, and, and I will tell you I um, was very concerned about what happened to that industry. Uh, and that industry clearly is over its head scientifically. It wants to do the right thing. It doesn't know what the right thing is to do. But we're going to have to stop just saying I mean, the, the hardest job, right, I mean, going to bed every night, being responsible, whether it's from China, whether that's, that ship is coming in from South America in the water and that ballast that, uh, that fresh produce is, you've, we've set up the agency not to be able to do its job. We haven't changed the food safety laws in decades. We haven't given the agency basic scientific resources to do the science to help the industry to know how to prevent those problems. And we've not established a preventive system of controls that help um, the farmers prevent those kind of devastating uh, outbreaks. This is not an FDA problem alone. It's going to require the Congress and the industry with the agency to recognize that we can hold hearing after hearing on whether it's China or whether it's spinach or whether it's peanut butter. But we have a system that is in major need of reform. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, appreciate your holding this very important hearing and your leadership on issues related to the Food and Drug Administration. I want to raise an issue, and I, I, I hope I'm not being repetitive with managing several resolutions on the floor and other meetings of missing some of the testimony. Um, it, it's an issue uh, that the Chairman, you've been a leader on uh, back in 84 with legislation on generics, and, and I know recently raised with uh, Senator um, Hatch on the issue of um, draft guidance uh, on uh, biologics and insulin uh, and human growth hormone. And, and Dr. Uh, von Eschenbach, I was wondering if you could give an update. I know my governor, uh, Governor Rendell, wrote to you about two months back, and I know a good number of governor, governors have either written you or spoken out on this issue about getting the draft guidance released 
to allow the process to go forward for generics on these specific biologics. I was wondering if you could give us an update of where we stand, um, especially in light of, and, and correct me if I'm wrong in my understanding, or at least the uh, general time frames that as, as early as a, a decade ago, um, that FDA committed to providing the guidance for these two specific um, biopharmaceuticals. And then in April of 2002, it's my understanding, they actually completed the science on the draft guidance uh, regarding these two biologics. So if you could give us an update, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. I'd be happy to pursue that and give you the update for that, Ms. Blaine, on the record with regard to what is occurring at this point. We have address this issue uh, with regard to ongoing challenges, both with regard to generic small molecules as well as the need to begin to address the issue of generic biologics or the follow-on proteins, and recognize this to be a, a, a portfolio in which there is tremendous diversity and complexity right. within that family of, of proteins, uh, ranging from very simple ones like polypeptides to the very complex Molecules, And so we're going to take this as an approach in which science and the scientific portfolio will lead us to be, made, to be making these decisions. And this is an area where Dr. Woodcock has really been working and focusing on developing our strategies for that scientific effort. And I will be happy to provide you the update of where we are with the guidance. If, if you can provide that to the committee for the record and, and specifically um, I guess in, in, I'd be interested in your response to uh, Governor Rendell's correspondence right. of February 15th that's specific to uh, insulin um, and human growth hormone, um, where we stand. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and I know that there's a lot of focus. In fact, I think the chairman, his letter was on that issue back uh, right. earlier and this past month in, in April. Yeah, I appreciate you allowing me the opportunity with those two specific things to get the uh, up-to-date information for you and respond to the record. A follow-up on that then, uh, in a broader sense, uh, is um, the, the broad issue of your authority. Um, is, is it a belief that FDA, um, in, the, in the area of, of generic versions of biopharmaceuticals, that, that you do not have the current authority to, to move forward in this broad area? Um, and if that's the case, um, have you looked at the legislation that's being considered you know, uh, to address that. Yes, sir. Th that's correct. And in terms of biologics uh, being included under the Public Health Service Act, we do not have a pathway within that particular act to deal with abbreviated applications. And that's one of the issues that Congress is addressing uh, with regard to regulatory authority. And we are looking forward to continuing to providing technical assistance with regard to that legislation. And particularly from the point of view of addressing the unique differences between the, this family of products as opposed to what our previous experience has been with small molecules or generic drugs. If um, on, on insulin and human growth, um, that, that's not uh, human growth hormone, that's not an issue of authority, right? No, that, that was addressed independently. Of that. Right. And, and so then the authority is going to these biologics and in, in not addressing that. Correct. As you sure. point out, okay. there, there are two statutes that govern our ability to m deal with uh, these compounds. Some of them come under uh, the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act and the biologics that we're now mo addressing come under the Public Health Service Act. Well, I, I do appreciate your following up with the committee and, and uh, for all of us members on that issue because um, you know, the, the important work of, of the chairman and, and Senator Hatch in 1984 and the access to, to you know, um, pharmaceuticals, it's not just that we have them, but they're affordable. And, and so this is a critically important, I know back uh, in Pennsylvania to our PACE program, our pharmaceutical contract for the elderly program, which truly makes a huge difference for so many seniors, um, you know, that in that one program, uh, this advancement, the estimate is, I think, over $100 million a year in savings. Uh, that means that many more seniors we can help. So I, I hope that we'll see uh, progress on the guidance on the uh, insulin and human growth hormone, as well as your agency working with this chamber and the Senate on legislation that broadens the authority for additional um, authority to your agency uh, for generics on the uh, biopharmaceuticals. So 
And, and I certainly appreciate your leadership today and, and our previous commissioners for your Thanks. important work on behalf of your fellow citizens. I don't, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the uh, great dedication of you and your uh, staff, present and past uh, FDA, FDA. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Platts. Ms. Watson. Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much. I'm so pleased that you're fulfilling the oversight function that this committee is authorized to do. And uh, I have some concerns uh, for the FDA. And I think a grievous oversight uh, has come from in the recent years is that the failure to stop the use of mercury in dental amalgams. And there have been studies done abroad that have shown empirical evidence that mercury is harmful to lactating women, harmful to children under 18, and probably harmful to humans. And mercury is always evaporating, regardless of how well it's sealed, because our teeth move around, they chip, they crack, and so on. And so I would like to know, and I'm sorry that I was late, I have not heard your testimony, but I would like to hear from someone why the FDA has not taken on this issue and moved on it. We know that it's harmful internally and why we would have any substance put in the mouth so it can go up to the T-zone, affect the meninges of the brain, and also go into the systems of uh, women. So can someone respond why FDA hasn't taken action on mercury amalgam? Madam Congressman, we continue to be con um, concerned about issues that you are alluding to and have continued to carefully monitor any scientific data and information that would impact upon a regulatory decision about uh, uh, dental amalgams. Let amalgams. me uh, take my time back. I would be pleased to provide you with the scientific information. That's the response I got last year. You're dragging your feet on this issue. And I wish you would speak to it. I'm going to send that information to you ASAP. And I would hope that you would respond. It's not good enough to say we continue to look at it. We know the harm mercury can do. We had a mercury spill last year in Virginia. They closed down three high schools for two or three days until they cleaned the mercury up. WHO is removing mercury from thermometers. We, we removed mercuricomb off the market, and we still allow it to be used in those silver fillings in one's mouth. That ought to put a light on, and you ought to move faster. I'll look forward to that information, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Any other member have anything else pressing, although I think the, uh, our witnesses have been very generous with their time. Let, let me thank you, because I, I think this has been a very helpful uh, session to learn from past experiences, the present situation, and uh, I hope that all of this will help you and help us figure out how to make FDA function even better. It's, uh, it's an agency that we all support, and I think you've got a sense on both sides of the aisle that that's the case. We want government to work. And if there's any agency of government that needs to work appropriately for the consumers of this country, it's the Food and Drug Administration. I think you've given us very specific and helpful uh, suggestions and uh, comments about different issues that uh, you're dealing with at the FDA today and the, the other three have dealt with uh, in the past. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. That, Thank you, members uh, of the committee. That concludes our hearing for today. We stand adjourned. Let me indicate there is a business meeting, and uh, we will try to convene the business meeting of the committee in five minutes. We'll take a little break. Now at C